Hi, hello everyone. Welcome to this session of uh, my NPTEL course, Appreciating Linguistics or Typological Approach. We are going to discuss lexical and morphological typology. So, this is just the introduction lecture and eventually I will move to the typological approach of lexical and morphological features of language. Uh, to begin with, um, let me ask you a few questions. Uh, what is, what do you mean by lexical and what do you mean by morphological? How they are different and what kind of uh, interrelatedness that they have? Why have I put them together? So, these are the two questions you should think about. When I say lexical typology, I should have covered it in a different unit. When I say morphological typology, I should cover it in a different unit, but instead of doing that, I have clubbed it together for a reason. That means, there must be some kind of connection or some sort of interrelatedness um, in this, uh, in these two terms. That is the first thing. And the other thing is that there must be certain differences, which is why I have used two distinct terms. Otherwise, lexical typology might um, take care of morphological typology and, and other way around, but that does not happen. So, considering that, we need to find out how they are different and how they are similar. Um, eventually, I will move to certain, um, certain fundamental questions, but first let us try to find out um, what do these two terms mean. So, when I say lexical typology, I am going to talk about certain words or certain phrases which are different um, or which are different separate independent units in different languages. Okay? I um, will give you the example of uh, uh, let us say kinship terms. When I say kinship terms, it is the family relations. So, when you say uncle, uncle as a lexical item is different from let us say mama in Hindi or, or mamu in Odia and uncle in English. So, these are the different lexical items used in different languages. So, uh, and when you, when you when you approach it from a typological perspective, we have to find out what are the types available um, in the lexicon of, of varieties of languages and what are the different words used for that. That is one thing. And when I say morphological typology, morphological is more abstract, lexical is more concrete. You, you can actually, these are distinct units and then these are, um, and you, it is easier to understand the lexical differences in a language than morphological. Again, this is a, this is a relative statement, but then um, for sure the morphological levels or the morphological analysis is more abstract than the lexical ones. In case of the morphological typology, we need to find out what are the different morphemes, what are the different parts of a single, of, of a single word or a compound word or a complex word and we have to analyze each part of it. So, in lexical typology, we are approaching it as a whole, a word as a whole, that is lexical. And when we say morphological, we are trying to identify how minimum we can have a unit of a word, like how many parts we can divide it into, so that we can examine, we can observe and we can, uh, uh, we, we can analyze each part of a word as much as possible. So, in that sense, both lexical typology and morphological typology would deal with words as far as the connection is concerned, interrelatedness is concerned. Both of them, they have one common agenda to understand the word system. But how it is different? When you approach lexical typology, you are approaching the words as a whole unit. But when you are approaching morphological typology, you are, you are looking at words with its subunits or with with its sub um, like with its sub parts I would say. So, lexical item means whole, morphological item means it is part of each word, it is the parts and sub parts right. So, with this information let us move to um, let us move to the fundamental questions that lexical typology and morphological typology would raise in linguistics literature. So, there are three questions uh, we have listed here. The first question is, what do languages have words for? Does the, sound, the, does the question sound a little weird? Because it ends with a preposition. It might be a little unusual for a lot of uh, um, traditional grammarians, because traditional English grammar does not really uh, appreciate use of 
preposition at the end of the sentence, but I do not know how else I could write it. Um, and as I always do, I do get the data and the examples from um, Moravzik's book, Introdu Introduction to um, Language Typology, published by um, uh, like introducing language typology published by Cambridge University Press. So, this is the question that has been listed there. So, um, so the first question is that why do languages need words or what do languages have words for? Why do you need a word? What is the role of his? What, what is the what is the necessity of having words in, 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 any, in any given language? So, that is the question. The second question Okay, we accept it. There could be some reason. We don't know what is the reason. We'll probe further. But then, um, given the condition that languages do have words, and words do have their own uh, relevance, because without relevance, generally we don't have anything in the world. Uh, each tiny thing that we encounter, or we, uh, or we meet, or we uh, experience, that would have certain um, that would have certain relation, or that would have certain relevance. Um, in our day to day life. So, we assume that or we accept the fact that languages have words and having words is sufficient to claim that they have relevance in human language. Okay? So, that is done. So, we accept it. Then the next question is, if languages have words and they are relevant, how are they? Like how, how the words would be like? what is the ideal situation or what is an ideal vocabulary that is the third question. So, second and the third they are the related ones or the connecting ones connected ones rather. So, um, if so now, now let us put all the three questions together which have some kind of connection between each other. Um, the first question what do languages have words for? Why do languages need words? Second, if languages need words and then they are pretty much relevant like any other grammatical items, then what would the words be like? How do they look like? How should they be? And uh, uh, what are the features of an ideal word? So, then the third thing is that what, what do you mean by an ideal vocabulary? So, vocabulary is the word system. So, in different languages, how, what are the features of an ideal vocabulary? How would you claim or what would you assume? Um, what would you call ideal as far as vocabulary in any given language is concerned? So, the third question will have two um, will have two features like if you ask me the third question, I would come up with two possible answers and both the answers are mentioned here. So, let us recall what is the question if you could if you could recall the question is what is an ideal vocabulary? what are you like what should be the features of it and when you say a particular language has an ideal vocabulary what sort of possible combinations would it have or what what sort of possible propositions it might have after this so first if a particular language has an ideal vocabulary or or uh, if i say the vocabulary system of a given language is ideal in that sense it will be the first possibility or the first explanation would be there is a word for everything. You name any or you look at any object or uh, you experience any instance or you feel an emotion anything it will have a word for it right. So, the idea the what one of the most primary feature of an ideal vocabulary is there is a word for everything every um, tangible and non tangible th sorry, tangible and intangible things. There should be a word for each kind of possible emotions, each kind of possible experiences, each kind of possible instances and each kind of possible object. Everything that you that you see that you think that you imagine and that you feel should have a name that is the first feature of, um, of an ideal vocabulary. And what is the second feature? The second feature is the way a word sounds it should be easy to tell what it means. So, there should not have two words having the same meaning or one word having multiple meanings that is also not uh, an uh, that is not an ideal condition for uh, 
claiming um, kind of uh, some vocabulary as ideal. So, and there should not be any mismatch between the pronunciation and um, and the word like and the meaning or, or the writing right. So, there should be there should not be any kind of mismatch between the phonetic and orthographic representation the way you write the way you should read them. Other way around if I if I want to approach it then listening to the word or reading the word if it is in the written form the way a word sounds you should get an idea easily what it means. So, the meaning of the word should be very clear from the way it sounds. So, these are the two primary features of an ideal vocabulary. So, the concern here is that do you think all the languages in the world um, kind of will have these two ideal conditions. What are the first condition? There is a word for everything. Second condition from the way a word sounds it is easy to tell what it means. If these two things or these two conditions are valid then we are going to or if these two conditions are accepted or, are, or, uh, or if they stand true then obviously, we can say the vocabulary of that particular language is ideal. But unfortunately, it does not work in this way for all languages and I would say for most of the languages there are words where there is a huge mismatch between the writing and then the uh, like the spelling and the pronunciation. There are certain words which have multiple meanings and there are there are multiple things which might be denoted by just one word. So, there are so many so many permutations and combinations that we that we would encounter when we gradually try to understand the lexical typology. So, these are the primary or the more fundamental questions uh, of lexical typology and when we try to understand it in a more abstract form at the abstract level then we are going to heading towards a morphological typology right. So, for the moment I am just going to keep it together. So, I would begin with the uh, begin the discussion um, with lexical typology and eventually we will think about the morphological ones ok. So, now what I will do I am going to list a few words maybe just a couple of them and we will see how many of these words you are familiar with because you remember I told you when I am discussing lexical typology I am going to approach the words as whole unit there is this whole and part relation ok. So, I am not going to target any part of it unlike what I am going to do in the morphological typology. So, here my focus is on the entire unit. So, what I am going to do I am going to write a few new words for you. I assume that some of you might not know what it is and I will give you a minutes time why do not you think about um, the possible meaning of, um, of these uh, let us say of these words right. So, let us write this. So, uh, I will give you some information about um, each word and then let us see how it uh, whether, whether you are. So, this is a noun, this is all of them, this is also a noun. This is a noun too. Okay. So, if you ask me what sort of parts of speech are they I am going to say this is these are nouns ok. So, what is what do you think um, what is the idea that you that you have when you hear a word like down pause right the other word like dasho then I think it is cinemuk if I am not wrong in pronunciation and then we have blubula. So, all of these words these are not much commonly found in the day to day discourse of a common man or of a of any human being for that matter. So, these are the um, context of the situation specific words I was talking about uh, um, how how is this ideal situation in any vocabulary. So, that you have words for everything right. So, the concern here is that what do you mean by everything uh, and what I added I added that everything means everything that you encounter experience feel touch see 
in in through your through through your all five senses right so anything that you that you can think about that you can imagine should have a word so that's the most ideal situation as far as um, vocabulary is concerned but if you if you think a little deeper into it you would realize that the words we are actually creating new words sometimes and we are deleting the old ones sometimes the meaning of the word uh, is getting changed so all these discussions will uh, will happen in my, in the next uh, couple of sec uh, next couple of sessions when i'll talk about neologism so but before that let me just give you an idea that it's equally difficult for us uh, to identify or to understand the meaning of everything as difficult it is to claim that my language has the ideal vocabulary or your language has the ideal vocabulary so um, it's th these situations are not that easy so so to reiterate or to go back to the question that we have words for everything that means we have to find out um, if if a particular language has words for everything so then there is absolutely no need to create new words or to or to bring in the novelty items into the lexicon so if if anything that you think about or anything that you imagine already has a word in that language so there is no scope of novelty uh, but fortunately it doesn't work in that way language is dynamic it keeps changing it keeps evolving no matter how slow the pace is that is why we do um, see or we do th there is the inclusion of novelty items in the lexicon or the lexical system of a, of any given language so we'll talk about a few um, examples in english as i have already mentioned in my previous lectures that the examples are primarily going to be in english because that's a common language between you and uh, between uh, between you and i because uh, the instructor and the participants they should have a common language to communicate and then considering we are talking about a common language english uh, there is no other language which could be better than this as far as an online teaching method is concerned right so what i'll do here i'll bring in a few um, english words the first word i have written here look at the list given it's down pause which is a noun and it what does it mean i'm sure a lot of you would hear the word for the first time and uh, for your information down pause means the split second interruption of rain as you drive your car under the bridge right so that's like this tiny second or the split second interruption when uh, rain stop stops as you as you are driving your car um, under a bridge right so that is the down pause then the second word i have listed here is dasho dasho also a, a new word for most of us and this is a this has a unique uh, a meaning also it's difficult for you to uh, use it in the day to day discourse though it is very essential um, but hardly do we use it what is it dasho is the area between a car's windshield and then the dashboard right so there is this dashboard and uh, there is the there is the windshield the gap between these two where we tend to lose uh, our pencils or coins and it's humanly impossible to retrieve it from there if your uh, if a if a coin slips into it or a tiny pencil slips into slips into the dasho area the area between the car's windshield and then the dashboard it's actually difficult it's almost impossible for a human to retrieve it from there so that is dasho then there is a third word cinemak i if i'm not wrong the pronunciation should be cinemak it doesn't seem to be cinemak so cinemak where uh, this means the sticky substance on the floor of a movie theater right so uh, when when you go and watch a movie hardly do you really notice the the sticky substance of the floor like on the floor so that is what we called cinemak and uh, uh, finally we have blibula so blibula means the spot on a dog's stomach which when rubbed causes his legs to rotate widely right so that is blibula so now my i would ask you to think about these words and do let me know how many of you have actually had some idea about the words and the context where it is used did you ever think about that split second of interruption of rain 
uh, when you drive your car under the bridge. Did you ever think about it that there could be a specific word which should be there for this context or for this meaning or for this, this situation? Did you ever think that there would be a space between uh, like some like the space between the dashboard and then the windshield would have a different name? Did you ever think the sticky substance on the floor of a movie theatre should also have a name, should also have an independent lexical uh, identity or did you ever think there is a particular uh, place, or there is a particular spot on the dog, on, on your dog's stomach, if you rub that area or if you, if you pat that area then the, then the dog is going to be very happy and the, the legs are going to be wide open. So, did you really think about these things? So, unless unless you actually um, you look around and unless you think that okay this particular uh, thing should have a word you would not really care uh, the words listed over here. So, this is called novelty items. So, these are the words or the, these are these are the instances or these are the um, these are the situations where you might uh, need more uh, like you might need more intervention of lexical items. That means, you might need how um, like you might need new words to fill the gap in these things. Okay? So, um, what, what I want to mean here or what I want to show here is that these novelty items or these new items, what do they show? They show that not only our language does not have words for everything, but also it would be difficult to define what everything means. So, that is a very important thing for you to remember. So, it gives rise to or such kind of words such these the list of four words that I have written here that that gives us an idea that our language does not have words for everything. Also, it would be difficult for a human to define what everything means. So, before you knew about these four uh, words, did you even know that there is a space which has a separate name between the windshield and the dashboard? No, not really. We know the windshield, we know the dashboard, but there is the, the middle area uh, between these two that also has a different name, we did not really think about it. So, that is why these are the two concerns that we have to uh, that we have to um, sort of um, we have to take in we have to take into account. Okay? So, I will give you a simple example. So, uh, th what are the two concerns? First, our language does not have a word for everything. Second, it is difficult to define what is everything. So, let us approach it from your bodily perspective. Okay? So, now look at your fingers. How many fingers do you have? We have 10 fingers and do you think all the 10 fingers they have distinct names? Yes, obviously this is a thumb, right? this is the little finger, this is the ring finger and this is the middle finger and this is what? Think about it and tell me um, what is the what and these five fingers are going to be on the on the right hand and the other five fingers are going to be on the left hand. So, you have a distinct name for each of the fingers, but do you think that is enough about your fingers? Right? So, why do not why do not you just give it a thought Did, uh, give it a give it a thought why do not uh, so if I if I tell you ok this is this is my thumb. So, in do not you think our language should also have a word for the inside of the thumb and then the outside of the thumb, right? You understand? This is the little finger. Do not you think the inside of the little finger should have a word and the outside of the little finger should have a word? Do not you think so? Is not it a logical question? Considering we are trying to explore um, a question like uh, words for everything. So, obviously, this is not this side if you can uh, look at uh, look at me in the uh, in the video. So, this side the inside of the finger is definitely different from the outside and if it is different from the outside how can you call this is also finger this is also finger. So, that means, this should the inside part should have a different name should have a different word and then the outside part also should have a different word, but we do not have that. So, together we call it a little finger, right? So, the entire this thing is little finger. So, we do not have a name for this, we do not have the name for this, not even that. There are how many knuckles here? There is one knuckle, the second knuckle is here. So, do not you think we need to have a distinct word for this knuckle, a distinct word for this knuckle, 
so that we can identify it easily, right? So this is funny, this sounds funny, but then these are uh, these are relevant questions, okay? And uh, when you when you look at the when you look at the the palm or uh, as a whole, don't you think each of the nails should have a different name? So for sure, my the nail on my uh, on my little finger is different from the nail on my on my ring finger. So if it is different from the ring finger, don't you think there should be a different word for this? There should be a different word for this. Why am I supposed to call both of them as as nails? So that means, and and look at the nails. On the top of the nails, you have a small tiny semicircle. If you if you grow your nails a bit, there is a semicircle here, right? So, don't you think the semicircle, the fingernails, and then the semicircle on each nail should have a different name? So, like that, you can divide just the palm into so many things, right? So, it's practically impossible. So, the first thing that we realized through the lexical typological approach is that. Uh, maybe some language uh, I probably I am not aware about, but there could be some language which have such kind of names, but then at least English does not have it, at least the language that I speak Odia does not have it, I am I would I am sure most of the Indian languages do not have it. So, why do not you think about it? Do you think your vocabulary is ideal? No, then the clear question would be there is nothing called ideal in any vocabulary, because we do not know what kind of uh, what kind of uh, um, um, we, we do not know what is what does it mean to have a word for everything and second we do not know what is the meaning of everything. So, considering these are the restrictions that we have, so uh, we need to figure out um, the relations or, or when we are trying to understand the lexical typology, we will focus on a certain relations or a certain um, certain things and we will try to find out how we can accommodate them uh, through a typological approach. Um, so, I should that there are um, Morabzik would talk about the semantic fills of 6 categories. So, uh, the discussion on body parts, the discussion on kinship terms, kinship terms from the family relations, personal pronouns, numerals, antonymic adjectives and color words. So, let me write it over here. Um, these are the 6 domains that Moravzik would discuss, the semantic fields. So, um, when I talk about lexical typology, the semantics of, I am going to talk about the semantic relation, the semantics of body parts. So, basically if, if you check the book, you will find out more information about it. Then there is kinship terms. We also have uh, uh, personal pronouns, right? Then we have, uh, let us say, numerals, antonymic adjectives, and finally, color words. Okay. So, I, I might just skip a couple of them uh, because I want you to go back to the book and find out more about it. So, these are the 6 different uh, fields where the semantic relation is being talked about. Okay. 